I'm a scientist, but today I'm going to tell you a love story. About once a week, early in the morning, I'll slip out of the house while my family still sleeps and head down to a local park in my neighborhood of Birmingham. As I wait for dawn to break, there's a chaos that's about to erupt. The first signs are some chips and peeps and warbles, and soon there are birds flitting about all over the place. They're hungry after a long night. Then I and any other bird watchers who've showed up try to find as many species as we can, identify them, and watch their behaviors. It's a lot of fun. I always see the neighborhood birds, the locals that are with us all year long. Seeing them is like seeing old friends. But I really enjoy looking for the rare species and those that are just passing through. Now, when I, those that are just passing through. Now there's, what I'm sharing with you today is a glimpse into my love affair with biodiversity. It started when I was a child, born into a family of expert naturalists and birders. By the age of nine, I was listing birds and identifying them on my own. In college and graduate school, I was studying ecology in Central America, Florida, and tropical Africa. These days, as a college professor, I teach my own students about ecology and conservation science and involve them in my research into endangered species. But despite all that learning, um, my heart still skips a beat and stutters every time I see some of these migrant birds that pass through our neighborhoods. Birds like scarlet tanagers and Baltimore orioles. Birds like painted buntings and rose-breasted grosbeaks various thrushes and hooded warblers. And despite all that learning that has occurred for me over all those years, when I see some of those rare species that I told you about, the ones that are disappearing, their populations going down, like the cerulean warbler and this ruby-throated hummingbird, my knees still go weak and my heart skips a beat. Now, it, this love affair of mine, I'm not the only one that's having it. There are many others in my community, hundreds of others, that are sharing similar passions. They are out there with binoculars and cameras, magnifying glasses and, and lenses, looking for all sorts of other species. Sometimes it's birds. Sometimes it's beetles and butterflies. Sometimes it's wildflowers and ferns, or even moths and salamanders. There are others out enjoying nature in different ways. There are hunters and fishers, backpackers and paddlers. We are all united in our common love of nature. And from these groups of people, there are friendships and communities that emerge that transcend religious, ideological, and political boundaries. It's a beautiful thing, but I would argue it's a critically important thing because those of us that have this love of biodiversity, this subculture, it has the chance to save humanity. Now to understand why, I have to talk about a darker side to this love affair with biodiversity. As I think you're aware, we're in the midst of a great environmental crisis. For the past 150 years, we have been waging war on nature. There are 7.2 billion of us on this planet. Just in the span of this talk, another 2,500 will be added to the roster. Each of these lives requires an ecological support system to provide the food and the materials and the clean air and water for a healthy and productive life. But our sheer numbers and our patterns of living are straining the ecosystems that support us. Already, it takes the planet 18 months to produce the resources that we humans consume in one year. What's more, if we all lived at the level of the average American, we would need five planet Earths. Think of that. We are living unsustainably, and we need to change our ways. Now, this environmental crisis is also taking its toll 
on the species that so many of us love. Already, the modern era has an extinction rate that is on par with the five great mass extinction events that have occurred in our planet's history in the three and a half billion years since life first arose. In the past few hundred years, we've lost thousands of species. These extinctions, you might think, are occurring in faraway places, tropical forests, Pacific islands. But they're also occurring right here in our backyards. In my home state of Alabama, we lost 90 species by the end of the 20th century. Among them, Carolina parakeets, passenger pigeons, and, and Bachmann's warblers. These are species that neither I nor any other bird watcher will ever have the joy of seeing. Now this loss of species is symptomatic of a very stormy relationship we have with nature. Nature sustains us through what are known as ecosystem services. These are the things that ecosystems do to provide the materials and resources we use on a daily basis, but also provide more complex functions, like protecting us against environmental extremes. These services are so important that in places in the world where ecosystems have become seriously degraded, the human cultures there begin to unravel. And already, we're at the point where 60% of the Earth's ecosystem services are being used unsustainably. Now here's the important connection between ecosystem services, biodiversity, and extinction. The science is increasingly clear that ecosystems are more likely to provide more services and better quality services when their native species are present and their populations are strong. That means that there's a network of warblers, worms, and wildflowers out there in the world that are sustaining humanity. There have been some powerful arguments made to convince us to protect nature. Scientists have amassed mountains of data illustrating that if we're gonna save ourselves, we need to protect the ecosystems that support us. Social advocates have pointed out that it's the world's poor that suffer first and suffer most when the environment degrades. Religious leaders have asked us to protect nature to be good stewards of the creation. These arguments have helped, but they've not been enough. Nothing has convinced a majority of the world's population to make the protection of the environment a top priority. Not climate change, not sea level rise, not pollution, drought, famine, nor extinction. Instead, the pace of ecological destruction quickens each day. It's from this dark place that I circle back to love. We need to live sustainably on this planet so that all people and all species enjoy a secure and prosperous future. But that's gonna take cooperation, it's gonna take innovation, change, and some sacrifice. These are daunting challenges. It's not gonna be easy. That's why I believe we need to invoke one of the most quintessential of human capacities, love. Love motivates us to do some great things. Think of how it moves you to care for your families, your friends, and your communities. Love can motivate us to care for the ecosystems that support us and the other species out there who are, after all, our only known living companions in this universe. That's why I say it is time for humanity to fall in love with nature. Now, some great thinkers have shown us that this actually is a possibility. This might be the next step, or one of the next steps, in the cultural evolution of humankind. Scientists such as E.O. Wilson have talked about the scientifically documented longing that people have 
to connect with other species and ecosystems. It's an instinct that's dubbed biophilia. Jeremy Rifkin and others have talked about empathy, our capacity to care for others, and how over the ages we've extended our sense of empathy to ever larger groups of people. These thinkers suggest that in this modern era of global awareness, we might extend our empathy, our love, to embrace other species. Certainly, the need is great. I believe the time is right and that we are ready. So then, how do you get people to fall in love with nature? Well, part of the problem is that we live in boxes. We call them houses, apartments, cars, offices, and classrooms. These boxes isolate us from nature. We've lost our connection. So, we got to get out of our boxes. If we're going to fall in love with nature, we need to head down to the equivalent of the local bar and meet some interesting and attractive species. <laughs> so, head to a nature center. Go visit a park and hike on a trail. Join others on a bird watching walk. Where, whatever you do, take a child along. They are natural explorers and they will lead the way. Once you're out there, start noticing the differences among species. Which ones do you find interesting, beautiful, or bizarre? Pick a few favorites, take some notes, and then go about identifying your species. It's easier now than ever before. There are websites, apps, plenty of local experts, and good old-fashioned books. Once you know the name of your species, look them up online and have fun finding out things like, what foods do they eat? Where else do they live? How do they fit into the ecosystem? But also, make time to find out the things that will build your environmental wisdom. Ask questions like, how does the species contribute to ecosystem services? And how has mankind affected the species over the ages? If you stick to it for just a little while, I think you're going to find that you start to see the world in a very different way. Nature will be less abstract, distant, and intimidating. And instead, wherever you go, you're going to see the connections between yourself and the other species and ecosystems around you. I think you'll also find that there's at least a few species out there that you don't want to see go extinct. And if you walk down that path, you'll find that you'll be joining the millions of others of us that have fallen in love with nature. And I think you know that for any sustainable relationship, you have to give something back. And maybe that begins with hanging a bird feeder at your office or planting wildflowers in your yard to provide more habitat, or supporting a local environmental organization. But what really needs to happen most is that we re-examine our lives to find ways to lessen our impact on the ecosystems that sustain us and the species that we love. Those would be the truest manifestations of a love of nature. As your lifestyle changes and your views evolve, others will take note of your newfound wisdom and some will be inspired to make changes in their lives. Some will even start their own love affairs with nature. And that is how the movement grows. Where before we had a subculture of a few that loved nature, we now have the social norm. And with time, we will find unity of purpose in building a future where all people and all species enjoy a secure, healthy, and prosperous future. This is why I've dedicated my life to helping others find their love for nature. It's an optimistic vision and takes a lot of courage and hard work, but it's the love story that can save humankind. Thank you. <laughs>